where did dinosaurs come from? Um, well, this video is going to introduce the ancestors of the dinosaurs and talk about uh, their evolution. And so if one were to then look at dinosaurs and ask what period in history did they live in, there are no dinosaurs known from the Precambrian. There are no vertebrates known from the Precambrian. There are no dinosaurs at all known from the Paleozoic era, and none survived in the Cenozoic era. So all dinosaur fossils are known only from this period, known as the Mesozoic era, starting in the Triassic period, then through the Jurassic, then through the Cretaceous. And so then if we were to ask about where dinosaurs came from, then the question would then boil down to, um, well, when we look at the first dinosaurs in the Triassic, where did they come from? Were there other animals which could then have served as ancestors uh, for these uh, dinosaurs. Now, uh, when we uh, consider dinosaurs, obviously when humans are thinking of, of human evolution, obviously our heads are important. I mean, our heads are where we have our big brains, which are so important to us. So I think there would then be the tendency to say, all right, well, let's consider the first dinosaurs and their heads, what made their heads unique. Well, this head here is a view park area. And it's got all the bones in pretty much the right places, even all the holes like this and orbital fenestra um, that you would find in a dinosaur. So this is not a dinosaur head. Um, it belonged to a small insect eating a reptile, but it looks a lot like a dinosaur head. There's not that big a difference between uh, the two. Um, when my students visit the Museum of Natural History, I had to prep them. One of the things you know, I say is, I mean, look at this Tyrannosaurus leg. This is unique. So first of all, this animal was walking on its hind legs. It was uh, not only erect, but it, its belly was not dragging on the ground the way, say, a reptile's uh, would. Um, uh, but then uh, also, it was upright where it was bipedal, only uh, walking on its hind legs. Um, but then look at this hip. This hip is, is very unique. So for example, we humans, and I'll get more into hips, ankles, and feet in just a few minutes. Um, we humans, we have three hip uh, bones, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Um, but the ischium and the pubis, they're rather short. So if you sit on your hands, you can feel the bump of the ischium where your hand strings attach. Your hamstring muscles, which extend the leg, they attach to a little bump called the ischial tuberosity. Look at this ischium. It's almost as long as the thigh. Look at this pubic bone, it's longer than the thigh. And the pubic bone ends with this expansion, which is almost the size of the ilium. Now, in humans, we're upright walkers. We do not have any of this. Um, but when we look here, obviously, these are modifications for walking upright. But imagine the size of the muscles which could attach to these long processes. We humans, we're good at walking upright, um, but our ischium, uh, I'm sorry, our pubis would end there, our ischium would end here. So we've got good muscles for upright walking. Um, imagine how big these muscles could be. And then we've got this weird leg um, uh, situation uh, going on, uh, which I'll uh, get back to where there's an elongated foot walking on uh, their toes. So in essence, um, it is the way that dinosaurs moved that made them uh, unique, not, the, um, not their heads. And so if we're going to ask, where did dinosaurs come from? Did dinosaurs have any ancestors? Then more so than talking about skull traits, we end up talking about uh, traits of the hips, uh, legs, and ankles. In the Triassic period, there were a lot of reptiles, including a lot of big ones. Um, the, the first dinosaurs, they had company. So while dinosaurs first appeared in the Triassic period, dinosaurs did not rule the Triassic period. They were not the largest um, uh, reptiles, at least not for the majority of it. Um, so there were all of these other dominant reptiles, including these big Rauwasuki. Um, but one of the things that the dinosaurs would develop is, once again, in all of the earliest ones, they were um, bipedal. Um, and so it was a different style of locomotion, uh, which would set dinosaurs apart from uh, the other groups of the time. Now, when we talk about biological groups and ancestry, uh, we often build cladograms. And then if we're going to use the name of a group, we're, we need to define that group. So, you know, when you identify something, it's not this subjective thing where if someone showed you some fossil bones and said, is this a dinosaur? You don't want someone to say, ah, 
yeah, yeah, call it a dinosaur. No, there have to be rules, all right? If it has these traits, it's a dinosaur. If it doesn't have those traits, it's not a dinosaur. Somewhere all of the dinosaur experts have sat down and written these rules so that there is an objective guide. This you know, animal belongs in this group. If it meets these criteria, it doesn't. And so then we ask, do dinosaurs just appear suddenly out of nowhere, or are they a subgroup of a larger group? Well, not only do reptiles go back to the, the Carboniferous uh, period, uh, but then later, a group by the Permian we know of archosaurs. Archosaurs are a group of ruling reptiles. That's what the name means. Arch means to rule, so your arch enemy is a, you know, your, a big enemy, not just any old enemy. So the archosaurs are the ruling reptiles. This includes crocodiles alive today, they are archosaurs, birds alive today, they are archosaurs, and a number of fossil groups such as dinosaurs and pterosaurs. And so um, the first uh, archosaurs are from the Permian uh, period. They survived the mass uh, extinction and then into the Triassic. And then in the Triassic, there are lots of uh, groups of archosaurs. So if we were to go through the family tree, first there are reptiles and there are traits which define the reptiles and dinosaurs would have those traits. Then there were diapsid reptiles which had two temporal openings. Um, um, dinosaurs would be among those. There are things which are almost archosaurs, having some archosaur traits, but not all, like um, uh, called known as the archosaur forms, and then there are the uh, archosaurs. Okay. Now, um, these archosaurs would start to show some of the dinosaur features. So, for example, Euparkeria, whose skull I showed you uh, a few minutes ago, um, would actually have been capable of not only being erect, dragging its belly off the ground, you know, unlike, say, the lizard, um, but also bipedal at least a little. So bipedal locomotion wouldn't have been its primary form of locomotion, um, but its body's, um, uh, its body's form would have allowed at least a little bipedal locomotion. Um, you know, some lizards can do that today. They can run bipedally like a basilisk or you know, a, a, a frilled lizard in Australia can run, run bipedally on their hind legs. They spend most of their time on all fours, but you know, their body is capable of that bipedal locomotion. So you park area would have been uh, capable of that. Also would have had um, elongated processes on its pubis initium, not to the extent that dinosaurs did, but nevertheless some. If we were to look at skulls, all right, uh, from the diapsids going into, uh, so diapsids like uh, Petrolacosaurus, uh, having those two temporal openings. Uh, we could then get into um, early archosaur forms and archosaurs. And notice that there are no really new skull um, traits. By the time we get to Euparkeria, it's just a modification of all of the other bones uh, which had already um, been there. Now, I mentioned bipedal locomotion. This is very important for the first dinosaurs. They were all bipedal. But a lot of the early crocodiles were capable of its, at least some bipedal locomotion. Uh, and so, um, uh, like I said, that Euparkeria being an archosaur uh, uh, would have had some, but not all of the traits that define the uh, dinosaurs, including some ad adaptations towards bipedal locomotion and some, a number of archosaur groups you know, had that ability. Within the archosaurs then comes another group known as the ornithodirans. Um, this excludes crocodiles. Crocodiles are not in this group, but would include birds, dinosaurs, and then the pterosaurs, which would obviously later adapt for flight. Um, but the first ornithodirans uh, would not have been. Uh, so there are a couple of traits which define this group. Um, and I, one thing I put in questions here, obviously some of the theropod dinosaurs have elongated scales slash proto feathers. Um, the first ones, uh, first feathers known were just kind of a fluffy body covering. Um, but some of the pterosaurs are also known to have had a fluffy body covering, you know, elongated scales, which perhaps frayed at the end. Um, and so the question, you know, could then be raised, did this ability to elongate their uh, scales as some sort of body covering perhaps uh, for warmth, did that evolve in ornithodirons before the dinosaurs? Interesting question. Um, and now obviously the pterosaurs, their lineage then elongates one finger, the fourth finger, and they adapt to flight, um, but that would not have been the defining feature of the first ornithodirons. 
after the pterosaur branch broke off, then we have a number of uh, fossil forms which are called dinosauromorphs. So here's a key thing. So if you're going to ask the question, does dinosaurs appear suddenly out of nowhere? Um, some people you know, have argued on uh, the creationist uh, side that um, nothing is part dinosaur, all right? That uh, you're either a dinosaur or you're not, there's nothing in the middle, so they had to have appeared suddenly. But all of these fossils that I'm gonna discuss now are what are called dinosauromorphs. They are not dinosaurs, but they have some of the features of dinosaurs, more so than any other reptile. So dinosauromorphs are more closely related to dinosaurs than, uh, uh, than they are to any other uh, animal. Um, but they are not dinosaurs. So they have some, but not all of the features of dinosaurs. I'll go through these. Um, so, but it then seems that uh, dinosaurs evolved in stages. So if you were to ask, how did dinosaur traits evolve? Some dinosaur traits evolved in early reptiles, in early diapsids, in early archosaur forms, early archosaurs, early ornithodirons, and then in stages in these dinosaur morphs before we get to the first uh, dinosaurs. So for example, the bipedal locomotion of the dinosaurs, it didn't appear suddenly. Um, but rather through a series of transitions. You know, early archosaurs include, you know, things which were not only four-legged, but sprawling. Um, but then there were things like Euparkeria, which were more intermediate, you know, quadrupedal most of the time, but holding their bodies erect, perhaps even capable of limited bipedal locomotion. But then among the dinosaur morphs, then there would uh, be some which were now obligate bipeds, that bipedal locomotion was the, um, uh, the uh, main uh, type of uh, locomotion. So the Triassic period did not just give birth to the dinosaurs by the middle of the period, um, but there were also a number of these almost dinosaurs. They were smaller, all right, often, you know, three feet, maybe slightly larger. Um, one of them uh, in some of my videos I label it as Lagosuchus. Uh, the last reading of, you know, some literature indicates that now there's discussion uh, whether there's separate fossil finds. One was called Lagosuchus, one was called Marasuchus. There's the question, are they the same one? In which case, Lagosuchus might be a syn synonym for Marasuchus. So they might be the same, they might be different, just uh, you know, for clarity's sake. Um, but there are a number of uh, reptiles uh, which were upright walkers. They were bipedal, but they were not dinosaurs. And so, um, there were a number of small bipedal reptiles. Now, there were obviously uh, other, I mean, there were small bipedal crocodiles. Uh, not all of them were dinosaur morphs. Reptiles can be bipedal. Uh, and we see a number of intermediate traits. So for example, um, dinosaurs would begin with an open hip socket with no bony back. That's odd. But before there were dinosaurs with an open hip socket, there were dinosaur morphs with a partially open hip socket. So once again, it seems that dinosaur traits uh, evolved uh, in uh, stages. So let me just kind of uh, repeat some of that, focusing on uh, the you know actual anatomy of the hips, uh, legs, and ankles, and then you know kind of go into the first uh, dinosaurs. So once again, a typical reptilian stance, and then the ancestral reptilian stance would have been to be quadrupedal and then kind of sprawling. Also notice there's a flat puboischiatic plate. So the pubis doesn't have a long extension from it, nor does the ischium. So this base here is a flat plate, unlike dinosaurs, where there were two big extensions. Also notice that the entire foot touches the ground. And in this entire foot, the ankle would have allowed a lot of different types of movement, including say twisting. So movement back and forth, but also twisting in a primitive ankle. Jump forward in time into um, then the archosaurs. And then we uh, uh, see that the uh, pubis now had an extension going from it. The uh, ischium had an extension going uh, from it, not to the degree that dinosaurs would, but moving in that direction. Um, but then also that the foot is uh, getting longer, as uh, you will see, not as long as we would see in uh, dinosaurs, um, but nevertheless uh, uh, getting longer. Um, now let me just kind of show what I mean uh, by that. 
So if we were to then, um, uh, once again, uh, so we're seeing a gradual transition from say a sprawling stance uh, to a, uh, a stance where bipedal locomotion is possible, but not the primary form of uh, locomotion, uh, to then a, um, a form of, uh, um, of, uh, of locomotion where bipedal locomotion is the primary form. Um, so in the ancestral uh, forms, uh, there was a flat puboischiatic plate, if these are the hip bones with the ilium, uh, the uh, pubis and uh, the ischium, there is this flat puboischiatic plate. Now, um, the word thecodont is often used, certainly more in the past. It's kind of a sloppy term. Um, dinosauromorph is probably the better term. Uh, thecodont is, you know, kind of just talking about, say, if you have a Triassic reptile uh, that isn't a crocodile, it's not a pterosaur, and it's not a dinosaur, what do you do? Well, you call it a thecodont. So it's a paraphyletic group, a more generalized group that's not in one of these uh, uh, three terms. But some thecodonts were more closely related to um, uh, crocodiles, some thecodonts more closely related to dinosaurs, so it's not a good biological term. Um, so uh, then uh, by the time we get to Euparkeria, like I said, uh, the hip is starting to change, getting some dinosaur uh, features. By the time you get to some of those dinosaur morphs, uh, like uh, Lagosuchus, Marasuchus. Um, now you have uh, an, um, uh, an extension on both uh, the pubis and the uh, ischium, so it's starting to look very much like a dinosaur hip. And this hip socket then starts to be partially open. Um, in dinosaurs, it will be completely open, but in the dinosaur morphs, it could then be partially open. So here's a transitional form, partway between uh, a dinosaur, and here would be the hip of an early dinosaur. Long um, uh, pubis, long ischium uh, pointing posteriorly, and an open uh, hip uh, socket. So there were dinosaur morphs, uh, which uh, you know had some but not all of these um, of these traits. If we were to look then at the bones of the uh, the leg, the ancestral condition is to have a tibia and a fibula, a bunch of ankle bones, and you want to watch this, these blue and purple ones because uh, special things will happen there, including these other ones. Um, but then when you see the metatarsals in green and the phalanges in yellow, um, they are generalized and the ankle allows for a lot of twisting. But then as time goes on, say by the time you get to the archosaurs like Euparkeria, you see that the foot is getting longer. So notice that the green and yellow bones are longer. Also notice that the ankle bones, the blue and the purple bone, um, are starting to become the uh, primary bones. And in this lineage, they are starting to associate with the bones of the lower leg. I'll you know, point that out um, uh, uh, presently. Um, and so uh, by the time you get into the dinosaur morphs, um, now you're getting into a leg that's looking a whole lot like a dinosaur leg where look how long the toe bones are. In fact, the animal's running on its toes. While this is part of the foot, the metatarsals, um, this is actually partway in the air now. It's no longer touching uh, the ground uh, while uh, moving. Um, there are now two uh, primary ankle bones and they are starting to associate with the bones of the lower leg. So here's a big difference between say a human ankle and a dinosaur ankle. In a human ankle, the joint, the ankle joint, occurs here above the purple and blue bones. But in the dinosaurs, the purple and the blue bones, the talus and the calcaneus, the talus in reptiles called the astragalus, um, they actually fuse to the bones of the lower leg, so the ankle joint occurs beneath them. So your ankle joint is here, but a dino, dinosaur's ankle joint was here, and these bones fused to the um, the lower leg. And so thus it was a very different type of ankle. It could only flex and extend, all right? So that limited its movement, but it made it very stable for upright walking. Ancestral ankles are capable of far more, you know, side to side and twisting, you know, the way that a crocodile's ankle um, uh, could uh, be. So not only did dinosaurs have this um, very unique uh, hip leg and ankle, um, but we see it developing in stages, going from these archosaurs into 
uh, these um, uh, from the archosaurs into these dinosaur morphs. Uh, we see this uh, developing uh, gradually. Now, just to uh, uh, be clear, I'd like to just you know go back through the legs of say uh, a, I'm sorry the dinosaur the bones of a dinosaur leg, and then and you'll see why this is important, the bones of a bird leg. So birds are modified theropod dinosaurs. And so therefore, it's actually, if you wanted to get an idea of uh, what dinosaur legs you know, were like, you know, you get a good idea from birds. So once again, the human hip has this ilium, ischium, and uh, pubis. Um, and so here, uh, you know, the question was how this uh, develops uh, slowly in... Uh, uh, in dinosaurs, also then just for, uh, for clarity's sake, um, humans have a talus and a calcaneus as their two largest ankle bones. So the calcaneus is the heel bone, the talus is the one that uh, touches the bones of the lower leg, and the ankle joint occurs above this, whereas in birds and dinosaurs, as you're going to see, um, the bones, uh, the ankle joint occurs beneath it. So we have the same bones as uh, we would see in the, the dinosaurs. Um, one of, uh, let me just go to my PowerPoint for a second. Um, one of the things I often ask my students is I'll ask them, um, you know, can your legs do this? Can you do that with your legs? And a lot of them, you know, like say no. But the answer is, well, of course you can. You do this, you're doing this with your legs right now. And the reason you think that you can't is because you're probably looking at this leg wrong. When you look at this, this probably looks like the knee, but it's not. That's the ankle. That's the knee. So when you look at this bird, it looks like the knee is bending backwards, but it's not. That's the ankle. It's just that the foot is really long. So here are the toe bones, but these are what are called the metatarsals, what's inside your shoe. So your foot, um, you know, includes all of these uh, bones. So um, a dinosaur or a bird, and you'll see in a second why, you know, I can compare the two. Um, their legs move like yours with one big exception. There's a thigh bone and a knee, which bends in the same direction yours does posteriorly. Then there's a tibia and a fibula. Then there's the ankle, and an an the ankle bends forward for you know, dorsiflexion. Um, so that bends in the same direction yours does. The difference is, Dinosaurs were just walking on their toes, the phalanges, but not their metatarsals. The metatarsals didn't touch the ground while they were walking. While when you walk, the metatarsals are making up much of what you, um, occurs, uh, is, is found inside your shoe. Um, and so if you were to look at Tyrannosaurus rex, here's the tibia and the fibula, but here's that calcaneus and the astragalus, the talus. These are your foot bones. They are beneath the ankle joint, but notice that in Tyrannosaurus rex, they are attached to the bones of the lower leg. They are above the ankle joint. Here are the other tar uh, tarsal bones. Here are the metatarsals, which in you touch uh, the ground, um, but here they're off the ground. Uh, Tyrannosaurus rex was only walking on its uh, toes. And um, so when we look at dinosaur legs, um, they're a little bit different from ours. Uh, and a good simulation would be birds. Birds have descended from dinosaurs and have the same leg as a theropod dinosaur. So here you can see the thigh, the femur, the tibia, and the fibula. The talus and the calcaneus, or the astragalus and calcaneus, are attached to the, um, the leg. Now in birds, a lot of the separate bones then fuse to make a solid uh, bone, so you don't see them as being as distinct as you did in uh, the dinosaur. So for example, the tarsal bones and metatarsal bones fuse to make a tarso metatarsus. Um, notice that uh, even dinosaurs tended to have um, a, a, a digit uh, which was flexed more towards the back, not as much as in birds. Um, their digit one, but nevertheless, you know, we can see a, a bit of that as uh, well. And so dinosaurs have very special uh, legs. Birds, having descended from theropod dinosaurs, have the same types of legs. And in these dinosaur morphs, um, we can uh, see then 
uh, the same um, uh, this, the, the same bones evolving slowly. So dinosaurs did not appear suddenly. There are these dinosaur morphs and archosaurs, which then slowly evolved the features of the hip, the leg, and the ankle, uh, which would make bipedal uh, locomotion in dinosaurs possible. Now, a lot of people, when they think of dinosaurs, they're thinking of the horned dinosaurs, the sauropods, T-Rex, but the first dinosaurs all looked like this. The first dinosaurs were small, three to six feet long. The first dinosaurs were all bipedal, even though many of the dinosaur lineages would become quadrupedal after that. Um, all of the early dinosaurs were uh, bipedal, and they were rather unspecialized. Later dinosaurs uh, could have long necks and be quadrupedal. Later dinosaurs could have armor. Later dinosaurs could have horns. Later dinosaurs had feathers. Some could even fly. Um, but not the first dinosaurs. So these first dinosaurs don't look that different from the dinosaur morphs. The dinosaur morphs were small, bipedal, unspecialized reptiles. The first dinosaurs in the mid-Triassic were small, bipedal, unspecialized uh, uh, reptiles. All right, and so it is from uh, dinosaur morphs, which looked about like this, uh, that we would get the first uh, dinosaurs, which would look um, about like uh, this. Uh, so uh, as I will pursue you know, in upcoming uh, videos, after I just kind of introduce this, um, later dinosaurs would evolve from these early forms and then we would split them into uh, groups. There would be what are called the Saurischian dinosaurs where the um, uh, pubis uh, then projects forwards. All right, that's what's known as you know, the saurish or lizard hip. You see the big pubic bone projecting uh, forwards. And then from the early saurish and dinosaurs, we would get the meat-eating theropods and the long-necked sauropods. Now, a lot of people, when they think of dinosaurs, they say, oh, they're so different. How could they be related? And you're right. You know, something like Allosaurus and something like a sauropod are very different from each other. However, that's not how they started. So in the Triassic period, the ancestors of both of those lineages were small bipedal animals, which then over tens of millions of years, then specialized. And the same thing um, in a second group of dinosaurs, the ornithischian or bird-hipped dinosaurs. Here you can see uh, in the bird-hipped dinosaurs, an early change was that the pubis bone was rotated so that it then faced backwards posteriorly instead of going forwards. Um, now, from small bipedal ornithischian dinosaurs uh, would then evolve the ornithish, uh, ornithischian groups, which would include the armored dinosaurs, the hadrosaurs, the duck-billed dinosaurs, um, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the horned uh, dinosaurs, and the pachycephalosaurs. And so even though dinosaurs would have all of these great lineages, they start off with small bipedal animals. So once again, a lot of people you know, forget that. They think of the, the dinosaurs later in the lineages, and they're very different from each other. But once again, the ancestors of all of these lineages were small bipedal. And even when you look at the early horned dinosaurs, the early sauropods, the early um, uh, ornithicians, uh, ornithopods, et cetera, they were small um, bipedal uh, animals. Uh, now, a lot of what we know, just if I'm introducing uh, dinosaurs, were gradually, uh, you know, developed over time. So, you know, perhaps a shout out to a lot of the early fossil hunters here. Um, one um, fossil hunter who does not get the credit that she deserves is Mary Anning. So she was a paleontologist. Um, she lived near a coast in England, and um, there was kind of like a family business. Her uh, father had collected uh, shells. I think her brother was involved a bit, but she was the primary um, shell collector. She's famous because as a young girl, she was exploring and um, uh, discovered the skeleton of a marine reptile known as an ichthyosaur. Uh, and so um, she is famous for having made a great fossil discovery as a young girl. Um, but then she continued to find you know, fossils and shells and to sell them and then a lot of the early um, biologists who were trying to make sense of fossils, like Buckland, uh, Cuvier, Mantel, Agassiz, Sedgwick, uh, and Sedgwick was a teacher of Charles Darwin, 
Um, they uh, got samples from her, they interacted with her. Uh, and so she had a great influence on our understanding of uh, fossils and, uh, and biology. One final note, um, the nursery rhyme, she sells seashells by the seashore. I have read um, originally uh, was attributed to uh, Mary Anning. So um, even though most people don't know her by name, uh, you know, in that sense, perhaps uh, most people actually do know her. Um, dinosaurs weren't universally known, and it was uh, Gideon uh, Mantell in the early 1800s uh, uh, who discovered two of the first three dinosaurs. When the word dinosaur was coined, it was based on just three forms, and uh, this uh, paleontologists discovered two of uh, them. Um, uh, the person who actually named dinosaurs had interpreted Iguanodon later as a mammal, and then uh, uh, Gideon Mantell uh, was able uh, to show that it was not and was actually a, uh, a reptile. Um, uh, William uh, Buckland um, was a noteworthy early geologist. He was one of those early geologists in the transition where uh, the scientific community was coming uh, to the awareness that the old view that they had had of the world, where it was maybe only, say, 10,000 years old, um, was, was not the case, and that there were these previous ages. So it was these older geologists who named things like the Devonian after... Uh, you know, fossils in Devon, England, etc. So they named the various parts of the geologic period because they realized they were understanding rocks and studying rocks in a way that uh, people hadn't in the past. He discovered a dinosaur, the second example of a megalosaurus. Um, and here I'd like to read just part of one of his theses. During these ages of reptiles, neither carnivorous nor lacustrine mammalia, so in other words, neither meat eating or uh, lake dwelling mammals of the tertiary periods had begun to appear. So it was these early geologists, um, even though they didn't fully accept, you know, the ideas of geology, which we had today, started to realize, wait, these rocks are depicting time periods, you know, so that there were diverse time periods and the animals in each were unique. So the animals here, you're not finding down here, that would be key to later uh, interpretations. Um, now, uh, when I say these individuals are the first who discovered, you know, dinosaurs or fossils, is that to say no one ever discovered a dinosaur before? No, that's not the case. The case. But so, for example, here was a fossil of the end of a thigh bone for a, a meat-eating dinosaur, megalosaurus. So here you can see the two condyles on the femur, which then articulate with the, um, the, uh, the tibia. Uh, at uh, the knee joint. So here's a fossil bone which had been discovered in the 1600s. However, it was described as being the testes of a four-footed mammal rather than the, the thigh bone of a bipedal reptile. And so these early geologists, they were the first to, you know, truly appreciate, um, you know, these fossils for uh, what uh, they were. Sir Richard Owen was a uh, uh, and the one who actually named the group dinosaurs. The name dinosaur means terrible lizard or terrible reptile. Not terrible in the sense of really bad. So for example, here we are in the mid 1800s and you may know the Battle Hymn of the Republic, you know, often sung in the Civil War, where some are referring to the sword of God as his terrible swift sword. And in that sense, terrible didn't mean really bad, but you know, just like awesomely great. And so, you know, here around the same time period, that's the, the sense that the word terrible is used, you know, this awesomely great um, uh, reptile. Uh, so uh, Sir Richard Owen, uh, uh, you know, was involved in describing uh, these early dinosaurs, just discovering one and the first to, um, uh, to name uh, uh, the group. Um, uh, and so, you know, these were, you know, quite the, the thing back in the day. I mean, today, you know, like a Jurassic Park movie, you know, it is a great blockbuster movie. We all want to see it. Well, back in the 1800s, people were describing these huge reptiles. They had the same impact. So here you see Charles Dickens. Um, Charles Dickens, amazing, you know, just like imagining what would it have been like when these, you know, reptiles uh, walked the earth. 
Just as, say, in Jurassic Park, we try to recreate what would these dinosaurs have looked like. Um, people drew these. What would this you know, great reptile have looked like? Now, they got some of the details wrong, but they didn't have complete specimens. So obviously, they can't be judged for that. So megalosaurus would have looked something more like this. But nevertheless, um, you know, there was a, a World's Fair where they tried to reconstruct, you know, a giant model of Megalosaurus life-size. And then so just like here we are, you know, hundreds of years, you know, later, you know, you know, with Jurassic Park movies and, you know, other movies, you know, trying to imagine what the dinosaurs look like, what would it have been like to have seen them? You know, from the first days when dinosaurs were first named, people had the exact same you know, reaction, let's draw them, let's try to make a model of them, what would it have been like to, to live, you know, to see one, that would, you know, significant. Now, um, while a lot of this is occurring in Europe, um, a lot of the, the first geologists uh, were European and English specifically. Um, nevertheless, in the 1850s, there was a dinosaur uh, discovered in New Jersey. Now, it wasn't originally appreciated as a dinosaur, it was thought to be human remains at uh, first, um, but nevertheless, um, it uh, was the most complete dinosaur uh, uh, remains known at the point of its discovery. Um, it was then put on display in the Philadelphia Academy of Sciences, and thousands went to see it. So once again, just a little bit on the United States. Um, early in the United States' history, there was the idea, you know, that you know, all of the great institutes of learning and all of the knowledge, et cetera, that was Europe and this young new world, you know, they were just kind of not up, you know, to par. But here, you know, this young United States, well, young United States had its own natural science academy, you know, and now, you know, here you have a, um, uh, uh, here you have the world's most complete dinosaur displayed for the public for the first time in the American Academy of Natural Science in uh, Philadelphia, uh, which was the first capital of the United States. Um, and, and so that, that was quite a big deal um, for, you know, not only the understanding of dinosaurs, but also for like the United States to, re to, to realize that, you know, you know, it had academic traditions and, you know, scientists, which were now, you know, at some point going to be on par with that of the old world and contribute to our understanding of the natural uh, world. In 1991, in this uh, statement here, uh, this hadrosaur was named uh, the uh, state dinosaur of uh, New Jersey, recognized, you know, uh, understandably so, for uh, its uh, significance. Um, uh, there. All right. And so, um, and what I had hoped uh, to do uh, here uh, was just to uh, answer kind of two questions. Uh, one, um, where did dinosaurs come from? And go to the uh, ancestors of the dinosaurs in the Triassic period, these dinosaur morphs, which had some but not all of the features of the um, of the dinosaurs. And once again, I focused on the hips, legs, and ankles. And if you wanted to visit, you know, like my videos, they will individually go through them a little bit more. And then talk about the first dinosaurs. Now, dinosaurs, you know, would then be recognized as a group. So I began saying that here we have these groups and there are features that define each, each group. So dinosaurs then are a group. All right, they are more closely related to each other than they are to anything that's outside the dinosaur group. So for example, if, if you ask, how do we know? What's the objective measure of this? Well, there are traits we could name. The shoulder is oriented you know, uh, posteriorly. The third metatarsal is curved. There are two small digits in the earliest ones. That astragalus has an ascending process. So here, for example, on a platyosaurus, you see the two uh, small digits, the fourth and the fifth. Notice how on Allosaurus, the um, uh, shoulder joint is oriented posteriorly. Uh, here's that open hip socket. We humans, we have bone here. Some of the dinosaur morphs had a partially open hip uh, socket. Um, now, I know it's odd to talk about the features that unite dinosaurs as a group, because the later ones seem so different. 
All right, some were four-footed, some were two-footed, etc. But if you were to look at the early dinosaurs, even early sauropods, you know, the later ones would be quadrupedal, but not the first ones. Many early, later ornithicians would be quadrupedal, but not the first ones. So their arms are all about the same at first, and then only later would change. Now, lots of things do change. So for example, while the first uh, dinosaurs were bipedal, like Herrerasaurus being a primitive dinosaur, it was bipedal. Notice the vertebrae which are attaching to the hip, which would therefore form a sacrum and stabilize the hip joint. Notice that there are two. Now, a later meat-eating dinosaur would have more than two, so it would add these other vertebrae in the sacrum to stabilize you know, where the uh, hip meets the spine. Here's a sauropod it also added additional ones. Here's an early ornithician. Um, but see, these would all occur later. So the first dinosaurs had features, but dinosaurs weren't done at that point. As the dinosaur tree branched out, then there would be you know, additional changes here. So even bipedal locomotion, while the first dinosaurs were bipedal, later groups of dinosaurs would then say, add additional sacral vertebrae, which would now make bipedal locomotion better. So just like you know, the dinosaur morphs had some but not all of the features of the dinosaurs, the first dinosaurs would have some but not all of the features of the later groups. So this was an uh, introduction into where dinosaurs came from with a few words on the very first dinosaurs.